Shopify is a global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. And sell more with less effort thanks to the Shopify magic, your AI-powered all-star. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash redcircle, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash redcircle now to grow your business, no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash redcircle. Early holiday savings have arrived at Tanger Outlets. Discover the best gifts from your favorite brands, perfect for everyone on your list. And stack your savings with up to 70% off, plus an extra 15 to 25% off only during Tanger Style. Save at Polo Ralph Lauren, Old Navy Outlet, Under Armour, Skechers, J. Crew Factory, and more. Hurry in. These early holiday deals last through November 24th. Tanger Outlets. More savings, more cheer. Live from Liverpool, the dark paranormal, season 17. Hello everyone and welcome back to our penultimate episode for season 17. I can't believe we're already at this point. The seasons most certainly do seem to be getting quicker and quicker as they go on. Now, firstly, a huge thank you to everyone who reached out following last week's episode. And of course, a massive thank you to everyone who's been submitting their experiences for season 18. Thus far, we have around 15 candidates which could be used to fill the season. But don't let that put you off sending in your experience. Because as we've proven time and time again on this show, if the right experience comes in, we will find a home for it. And of course, some of our best and most memorable episodes we've had have been those ones that have come in last minute. And as we've often talked about in this season... Our show has kind of evolved into a show where we just look at one person's paranormal experience into wanting to get as many paranormal experiences on record as possible. So even when it comes down to the length of your experience, that's now irrelevant. We want all of your paranormal experiences and we will guarantee we will find them a home, be it on the main episode on a mini-sode, or indeed on our Patreon show, Dark Bites. I genuinely believe that now, after 17 seasons, we've found our niche, we've found our groove, if you will. We've found what our listener base is. And our listener base are those individuals, like me, who are open-minded, but not so much that our brains fall out. And also, we enjoy a good scare. There's almost two edges to this podcast. Firstly, we obviously want people to realise the paranormal exists, but it exists in the darker sense of the word too. The analogy that I often use in this podcast is that, say, of the workplace, where someone may say they've felt the presence of their dead pet, and they're greeted with ah, or sympathy, or kind looks. Or somebody else may say a member of the family has died, and they called out for somebody who's already deceased and said they're standing in the corner and everyone says they were waiting to take them from this life into the next life. What a beautiful story. But then when somebody says if they're ever brave enough to do so, last night I was pulled out of bed by my ankles, by some angry malevolent force, you no longer get that sympathy or empathy. My point being... You can't have one without the other. You can't believe in only benign and benevolent spirits. You have to take the rough with the smooth. And the second part, in truth, is that we all enjoy a good scare. And to me at least, there's nothing scary about the ghost of a deceased pet. Hence the title of the podcast, and hence over 160 episodes all dealing with the darker side of the paranormal. And now we've found our niche, so to speak, we're looking to add to our roster of output from season 18 onward. And our final two episodes of season 17 
are a great way to sign off the kind of older format. Because believe me, the two experiences that we're going to cover have been a long time coming. The first one you will hear today arrived in January of this year. And the second one we will hear next week arrived three weeks ago. Each of the submissions that you will hear could indeed make their own episode. And in fact, the one you're about to hear today was going to be part of season 16, after I'd sent a follow-up email and received nothing back. But then I did, so I decided to store it. And you'll find out why I'm so glad that I did. But before we hear that submission, we need to say a huge thank you to our newest team members over on Patreon. When you decide to join our Patreon, not only will you receive everything on this main feed, both ad-free and before everyone else, and that includes the main episode and any minisodes that we have on, but you can also gain exclusive access to our Patreon-only podcast, Dark Bites. Dark Bites comes out every week of the year, even on the downtime between seasons. And with the break in seasons coming up, there is no better time to sign up. Plus, there are well over 60 hours worth of episodes for you to sit and binge. But as I always say, the best reason to sign up is our community. We've built a wonderful community of like-minded paranormal enthusiasts just like you. And we'd love to extend an exclusive invitation for you to join our team. Head over to patreon.com forward slash the dark paranormal just like the following wonderful new team members have lita hunter loran luthi keena bush luke irvin james smith maria lauren reeves kim bowden devona fisher didge beth barnes brie sebastian schrader ruver shannon mags michael s ted kr and amanda thank you so much guys i hope you enjoy all the extra content and of course all the ad free early releases including next week's finale and the upcoming debut of season 18 But right now, it's time to lower those lights, make yourself comfortable, and most importantly, leave your disbelief at the door, as we hear all about the hollow-eyed jester. Hi, I'm Emma, and I wanted to share my experiences from living in my childhood home in Derbyshire. The house itself has been in my family for over 200 years. And to say that this house had something strange about it would be an understatement. You see, I grew up there. I lived there for years. And eventually, I inherited it from my mother. But the things that happened there never really let me feel like it was my home. My experiences started when I was very young. The one most prevalent was when I first saw him. The one I've come to refer to as the jester. I had just turned eight years of age, and I know that because it happened a week after my birthday party. A party which had its own controversy when one of the people invited... One of my friends claims to have been pushed down the stairs by unseen hands. Of course, no one believed her, thinking that she'd made it up. And even though my own mother seemed more concerned than her own parents about her story, I kind of brushed it off. The girl was known for tall tales and kids fall, let's be realistic. But this was a week after. I remember waking up in the middle of the night, not for any particular reason. You know, suddenly you get an alertness that jolts you awake. Well, that's what's happened here. And when I opened my eyes, I saw him. As ridiculous as this sounds, he was a court jester. And he was inches from my face his pale white skin practically glowing in the dark. His eyes were just two pits, black as night, and his grin was stretching impossibly wide as he tilted his face from side to side. He was dressed in red and black. 
his costume frilled and elaborate but filthy, and these hollow eyes blinked. But with every blink, you could see the skin stretch as he forced his eyelids open. I blinked, thinking it was a trick of my groggy mind, but he didn't disappear. He just continued to look at me with his black, hollow eyes. I squeezed my eyes tight shut, and when I opened them again, he was still there, albeit slightly now more opaque. I tried to scream, but my voice was caught in my throat. But the fact he'd faded slightly gave me enough courage to jump out of bed and run through the door. I could feel my skin prickling, my ears ringing as I bolted from the room. Just as I reached the top of the stairs, I looked back. And now, not only was he stood in my doorway, watching me, still with that twisted grin, he seemed somehow larger, more solid. I flew down those stairs, two at a time, my heart pounding out of my chest. The living room felt like my only refuge, and I dove onto the couch, covering myself in the pillows, panting, trying to steady myself for his arrival. And I wasn't disappointed. But then, something very strange happened. The jester had followed me down the stairs, and as he entered the room, his grin seeming wider than before, his demeanour changed. His grin faltered. His black pitted eyes widened. The closest I could get to describe what he looked like was afraid, which is bizarre considering what he looked like. But he turned and stared at the chimney breast, staring at it transfixed. Slowly, almost as if he were in a trance, he began to back out of the room never taking those pitted eyes off the fireplace. He disappeared around a corner, and I heard nothing else all night. Somehow, despite everything, I now felt safer in the living room, especially in front of that large, grand fireplace. In fact, I ended up sleeping there almost every night after that. There was something about that fireplace that made me feel protected. Like it was keeping whatever that thing was away. As I got older, the strange occurrences continued. When I was about 12, I remember being woken up one night by the entire house shaking. Like there was an earthquake. In fact, I was convinced it was an earthquake. My bed shook The walls trembled. Even our old fake crystal chandelier in the hallway rattled away. It felt like the whole house was going to come apart at the seams. I remember laying there, frozen, waiting for it to stop. And thankfully, eventually, it did. I recall the next day walking to school and thinking to myself, why is there no damage anywhere? And when I reached school, I assumed it would be the topic of the day. But it turned out no one else experienced what I did. I was mid-level liked in school. I wasn't bullied, and I certainly wasn't a bully. But by the end of the day, almost everyone was laughing at the girl who believed she encountered an earthquake the night before. The jester still made his appearances every now and then always at night, always with that same unsettling grin, but now at different parts of my room. Sometimes he would just stand in the corner. Other times, again, he'd be just inches from my face. And now I'd grown accustomed to sleeping with my bedroom door open, sometimes he'd just stand himself on the landing. You would think a child of my age might have jumped under the covers, but... There was no way in hell I was going to take my eyes off him. I had a fear, for example, if he was in the hallway and I hid under my covers, when I would reveal myself, he'd be inches from my face. 
so I always wanted to keep track of where he was. Sometimes he would dissipate. Other times, somehow, I'd fall asleep. It's only by listening to your podcast that I've realised that's a normal part of some of these hauntings, no matter how terrifying they are. And in truth, it's one of the things that I tend to keep to myself when I reveal my story. Because the obvious reaction you get, and I understand why, is how can you sleep with a jester staring at you with no eyes? And believe me, if I'd not experienced it myself, I'd be asking the same thing. But that's what happened. I never told my mother about him. She was always preoccupied, always busy. My dad had passed away from a heart attack when I was young, and she was doing her very best to keep us afloat. Dad's death was sudden. I was only six when it happened. It was a heart attack he suffered at work, and just like that, he was gone. My mother was shattered. The days that followed were filled with emptiness, and even as a child, I could tell that she was struggling to keep herself together for my sake. I don't have children myself, but I do say to my friends who do, you'd be surprised what they pick up and can take in, even at such a young age. She did try her very best, but there was something in her that just seemed to break after that. Of course, she still loved me. She made sure I was fed and had everything I needed. But her warmth seemed to fade. It was replaced by an exhaustion that she just couldn't shake. After Dad's death, Mum became more and more withdrawn. She was never one for showing emotions. But now it was like she had nothing left to give. She stopped going out as much. She stopped talking to neighbours. Started spending much more time alone. But I would often find her sitting in front of the fireplace, staring into the flames, her eyes distant. She'd sit there sometimes for hours, barely moving, just staring, as if she was waiting for something. Sometimes, from where I'd be playing in the hallway, I'd hear her talking, low whispers, almost like she was having a conversation. Now, I never caught wind of what she was saying, and whenever I would ask, she would brush me off. Oh, I'm just talking to myself, she'd say. But I kind of knew it was more than that. It was around that time I started to hear rapping sounds. They were faint, almost imperceptible. Like someone knocking from the inside of the chimney wall. I'd hear them at night when the house was quiet, or in the middle of the day when Mum was sitting in front of the fireplace, whispering. It was like as if something or someone was answering her. The sounds genuinely terrified me, but Mum seemed to find some comfort in them. I'd catch her smiling at the fireplace, her eyes softening as if she understood something that I couldn't. One evening when I was about 17, I was studying on the couch in the living room. It was late and the house was quiet, too quiet. I was focused on my notes and I felt something move beside me. Like a small movement, like something crawling underneath the couch. I froze. My heart was pounding. We didn't own a pet. I stood up, turned around and slowly bent down to look. And there, beneath the couch, I saw two white eyes staring back at me from the shadows. They were low to the ground, far too low for any person to be under there. My stomach dropped, and a cold wave of fear washed over me. 
I jumped up, my notes scattering to the floor as I backed out of the room, and then I ran to the front door, and despite the icy temperature, I did not go back inside that house. I stood outside, shivering in the cold night air, my breath coming in short, panicked bursts, and I waited until my mother came home. And then there were our names being called, by who we thought were each other. My mother and I would hear each other's voices being called out when the other wasn't there. I'd be upstairs and I'd hear my mum call my name from the kitchen. I'd go down and find the house empty. She once told me she'd heard laughing from my bedroom when I was at a friend's. These moments left us both uneasy. We never talked about it much, but we knew something strange was definitely happening. Something was mimicking us, playing tricks. Let's take a quick break to tell you about something I'm doing personally and I find it amazing, and that is learning another language. I've mentioned previously that I felt almost embarrassed going around Europe and every country I went to, they spoke both their natural language and English. I've chosen French to begin with, but I do want to learn Italian, maybe Spanish, and I'm using Rosetta Stone. There's a reason why Rosetta Stone is the most trusted language learning program out there. And for me, it's the immersion in the language that you get. You don't, for example, have any English when you're doing these lessons. You have to learn to speak, listen, and think in the language. Personally, I use the app and I found a few moments a day has really improved my knowledge of French. You don't even need an app, you can use the desktop version. And there's a reason why Rosetta Stone is the trusted expert for 30 years with millions of users and 25 languages offered. It also has an amazing speech recognition program in there called True Accent, which gives you feedback on your pronunciation. All of this combined with the convenience to learn anytime, anywhere means your language acquisition is so fast. Talk about amazing value? Well, some language companies may offer discounts, but they won't be for a lifetime membership, whereas Rosetta Stone offer a lifetime membership to all 25 language courses for 50% off. A steal. Don't put off learning that language. There's no better time than right now. And Dark Paranormal listeners can get Rosetta Stone's lifetime membership for 50 percent off by visiting rosettastone.com forward slash today. That's 50% off unlimited access to 25 language courses for life. Redeem your 50% off at rosettastone.com forward slash today today. Spark something uncommon this holiday with just the right gift from Uncommon Goods. When Halloween comes around, you know the busy holiday season is upon us, and Uncommon Goods makes it less stressful with incredible hand-picked gifts for every last person on your list, all in one spot. Gifts that are so unique, you're basically buying a feeling with the gift. Would you like to give someone the gift of, they know me so well? The gift of, this is exactly what I want? Because if you do, then Uncommon Goods is for you. They scour the globe for original, handmade, absolutely remarkable items. I've personally ordered a beautiful looking hand-blown glass ball called a wishing ball. And the lucky person receiving that gift is the person that everyone finds difficult to buy for, but not at Uncommon Goods. And when you do shop at Uncommon Goods, not only do you support the artists and small independent businesses, but with every purchase you make at Uncommon Goods, they give back $1 to a non-profit partner of your choice. And they've already donated more than $3 million to date. To get 15% off your next gift, go to uncommongoods.com forward slash dark paranormal. That's uncommongoods.com forward slash dark paranormal for 15% off. Don't miss out on this limited time offer. Uncommon Goods. We're all out of the ordinary. Shopify is a global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. And sell more with less effort thanks to the Shopify magic. Your AI-powered all-star. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash red circle, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash red circle now to grow your business, no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash red circle. As time moved on, mum sat me down in the kitchen one day and told me her health, both mentally and physically, she felt were failing her. And she wanted to sign the house over to me and was going to voluntarily place herself in a care home. 
She said she'd found a nice private place only five minutes away from the house, and asked if I wouldn't mind if she moved. Now, realistically, what answer do you give to your parents when they tell you they don't feel physically or mentally able to live where they are, and they're asking your permission to move? Of course, you say yes, which is what I did. Despite everything, I still tried to have a normal life. I worked as a graphic designer for a small agency in town, and that's where I met Jess. Jess was different. She had a curiosity about the world that kind of matched my own. So when I told her about the strange things that were happening in the house, she didn't laugh or dismiss me. Instead, she listened. Genuinely intrigued, we bonded over our love of the supernatural, and soon enough we became very close friends. Jess would come over often, and we'd spend hours talking about ghosts, urban legends, and the mysteries of the world. It was really comforting to have someone who understood, someone who didn't think I was crazy. One day, Jess came over for a coffee. We were catching up in the living room, and I went to the kitchen to grab some biscuits. As I was in the kitchen, I heard Jess talking, like having a full conversation with someone. So I assumed she was on her phone. But when I came back in with the biscuits, she looked up at me and smiled. He seems like a nice guy. She said casually. I felt my stomach drop, a sudden sense of unease. Who? I asked. I could feel my skin start to tingle. She nodded towards the chimney breast, her eyes softening. Oh, he's gone now. He must have went into the hall. But there was an elderly guy I was talking to by the fireplace. I just stood there. My mind was reeling, trying to understand what she was talking about. There was no old man. I ran into the hall and looked left and right. There was never anyone there. I tried to ask her about it, but she just shrugged, like it was the most normal thing in the world. After that, I was convinced there was something dark in this house. Watching, listening. Jess acted like she'd forgotten all about it, but I couldn't forget. Not after everything I'd seen, everything I'd heard. It all led up to the day I decided to get rid of the fireplace. I started the demolition on a bright Saturday afternoon. I remember standing there with the hammer in my hand. Ready to take the first swing. The moment the hammer connected with the brick, I heard something. Not the solid thud of brick breaking, or metal hitting the resistance of stone, but the sharp, brittle sound of something shattering. I stopped, confused, and looked down into the fireplace. And there, amongst the rubble. Was a mug, an old porcelain mug, cracked and covered in soot. It seemed to have fallen from inside the chimney, from somewhere high up. I picked it up and turned it over in my hands, and I felt a chill run down my spine. It wasn't just a mug; it was, I don't know, a sort of. Undefinable feeling was attached to it. There was something else there, something hidden. That night, I called my mother to tell her what I'd found. That there was a long silence on the other end of the line. That night, I called my mother to tell her what I'd found. There was a long silence on the other end of the line, and when she finally spoke. Her voice was barely a whisper. I need to tell you something. Her voice trembled. 
and I could tell that whatever it was, it terrified her. She said she wouldn't tell me over the phone. Instead, she asked if I'd visit her tomorrow. I agreed, though a part of me wasn't sure I wanted to know. The next day, I went to see her at the care home. She looked smaller, frailer than I remembered. Her eyes sunken but alert. She took my hand, her fingers trembling, and she began to tell me her side of the story. I'll share part of it with you, but part of it I won't say without her permission. She spoke about the house, of the things she'd seen, the whispers she'd heard. She told me about the day after my dad had died, how she'd sat in front of that fireplace, lost in her grief, when she first heard a voice. She said it was a man's voice, soft, comforting, telling her that she wasn't alone. At first, she said she thought she was losing her mind, but the voice continued, night after night, always from the fireplace. It would tell her things, secrets, promises, reassurances she would be okay, things only her and my dad would know. She believed it, she found solace in it, but then it began to change. The voice became demanding, insistent. It wanted something from her, something she couldn't understand. It told her to stay. No, it demanded that she stayed, that she never left the house, and that she should protect the fireplace at all costs. She tried to ignore it, but that, she said, is when the rapping sounds began, the ones I was hearing too. She became scared, but by then it was too late. The voice had a hold on her, and she didn't feel like she could break free. She then told me she moved into the care home, not because of her declining health, but she was terrified what might happen if she stayed. She looked at me, her eyes filled with tears, and said, I genuinely thought it was your father, Emma. But it's not. It wasn't. It's something else. I felt my blood run cold. A chill spreading through my entire body. She told me that she tried to protect me, and that the fireplace was the only thing keeping whatever it was at bay. She begged me to leave the house, to never go back, and for God's sake, don't touch the fireplace. But I couldn't. It was my home. And I wasn't going to let whatever this thing was take that away from me, from us. I stayed up that night, thinking about everything Mum had told me. I tried to rationalise it, to make sense of what she'd said, but deep down I knew she was right. This house wasn't just haunted. It was like it had its own will, its own desires. That night, I heard the rapping again. I could feel it reverberate throughout the walls, through the floorboards. I knew it was coming from the fireplace, but I couldn't bring myself to go downstairs. Instead, I stayed in my room thumbing the mug that I'd found, feeling its cold weight in my hands. The next morning, I called Jess. I needed someone to be there with me, someone who would understand. She came over right away, and together, we decided to finish what I'd started. We were going to tear down that fireplace brick by brick, until there was nothing of it left. We worked mainly in silence. The walls were extremely thin considering the size of the thing, like it had been hollowed out from inside. As we worked our way deeper into the chimney stack, we began to find things, trinkets, 
pieces of porcelain, old photographs, all covered in soot and ash. It was like the fireplace had been hiding these things, holding on to them. One particular photograph caught my eye. It was of a family, dressed in old-fashioned clothing, stood in the front room of what looked like my house. But there was something off about the picture. And then I realised the faces of the family were blurred out, almost like they'd been smudged out by a thumb. And in the background, barely visible, was the figure of a man stood by the fireplace and his face had a very strange smile. I showed the photo to Jess, saying, How creepy is that? Emma, we need to stop, she said, her voice barely a whisper. Why? I said. We just need to stop, she said, louder. Well, tell me why then? That man's the man that I had the chat with. The one that was leaning on your fireplace. We both looked in each other's eyes for a good ten seconds before I said, I'm going to have one more go. I took a swing with the hammer at one last layer of bricks and behind those bricks was a small, dark space. And inside were two things that made my blood run cold. One was a small, tiny wooden stool. God knows how old it was, but if it was designed to hold a man's weight, I don't think it was fit for purpose. The other was a wooden marionette controller, like what a puppeteer would use. There was no puppet, of course, but tied to a piece of string was a tiny torn piece of fabric, black and red striped the same colours as the jester I'd seen all those years ago. I felt a wave of nausea wash over me, and I dropped the hammer stumbling back. Jess grabbed my arm, pulling me away. We need to get out of here, she said. But I couldn't move. I was frozen, staring at the stool, the fabric, the picture. There was something else about that picture. The fireplace. My fireplace. Well, it wasn't a fireplace. It had two small wooden doors intricately carved and closed over. Like a secret entrance, but out for all to see. The photo still in my hand, Jess basically pushed me out of the house. I left the house that day, and I haven't been back since. I moved in with Jess for a while, and eventually I decided to sell the house. I couldn't stay there. Not after everything had happened, and not after what we'd found. The house was empty for a long time, but eventually someone bought it. I don't know who lives there now, and I don't want to know. I just hope that whatever was in that house, whatever was hiding in that fireplace, is gone. And that's where I leave it for now. But for the full version of what my mother told me that day, well, that would make one hell of a story in its own right. But I'd need to ask her permission first. Let me know if you'd like me to do that, and I'll ask. Hopefully, my experiences alone will pique your interest. Many thanks for all you do, Emma. Well, thank you so, so much, Emma, for providing our penultimate episode for Season 17. And both you and I know what's to follow. Because next week's finale is your mother's story, direct from her own hand. And ever since receiving Emma's story in January, I knew this would be worth waiting for. And believe me, it is. And so, until Wednesday of next week for our final mini-sode of Season 17, we will then wait two days until we get to hear from Emma's mother. And the finale 
of season 17. Until then, stay safe, take care, and remember, when you're discussing the paranormal, always try to keep some of your disbelief at the front door. And I'll speak to you next time, here on The Dark Paranormal. Let's make fall easy with SD Services. Our furnace replacement repair and maintenance make it easy to stay warm in the cool fall months. Our electrical system upgrades and repairs keep everything up and running, so you'll never miss a play. And our plumbing services will keep the hot water flowing on a cold fall evening. When you're the best, you're in demand. So don't let the cold weather catch you by surprise. Call or visit our website to make an appointment today. It's that easy. It's Estes.